event from the EU funded In Green project, building a new bio-based value chain from lab to market. My name is Dr. Helena McMahon. I'm a head of department in the School of STEM at MTU, and I'm also the co-lead of the Circular Bioeconomy Research Group. Developing a new bio-based value chain is a key example of the bioeconomy in action. In its simplest form, it involves the development of a new product from a natural renewable resource, it could be biomass or it could be a side stream, into a range of products which could include biochemicals, food ingredients, polymers or textiles. Today's event will focus on the creation of a new value chain connecting the dairy and cosmetic industries. Firstly, I'd like to give you a very brief overview of the InGreen project. So the InGreen project is a Horizon 2020 BBI GU demo project which has secured 8 million euros in funding to develop several new bio-based value chains from a range of industries. The InGreen project brings together a consortium of 17 partners in 10 countries. So this includes a mixture of SMEs, large industries, research and technology centres and industry associations. The project scientific coordinator is Professor Rosalba Lanciotti. She's from Univo in Bologna, and the project coordinator is from the UK based Inuvo, and it's led by Narendra Barnes. So, In Green is focused on the development of value chains from three industry side streams, providing innovative bioproducts for the food, feed, pharma, and cosmetic sectors. This includes the paper milling waste from Smurfacapa. This is converted into PHAs and PHA enriched biomasses for use in animal feed and biodegradable packaging fills. The second example is the wheat and rye bran milling side streams from Barilla. So these are converted into pre-fermented functional ingredients and these are for use in nutraceutical func and functional bakery products. And finally, whey from Mambelli is converted into LBA and GOS and these are for use in the pharmaceutical, cosmetic and functional cheeses. Developing a new value chain is highly complex, very innovative and very challenging. It involves the development of new processes, new technologies, and it involves lots of testing, validation, piloting and new product development. In addition, it can also involve the, new, the development of new business models, which take into account stringent regulatory compliance, supply chain and logistic issues. Consumer testing and market development are also key activities. It's very risky, it's expensive, it's technically demanding, and there are no guarantees of success. These projects require a team, a multidisciplinary team, incorporating researchers and industry, and a high measure of entrepreneurial agility. In today's event, we are specifically going to focus on the dairy industry and the creation of a new value chain going from the dairy industry to the cosmetic industry. We have a fantastic series of speakers from industry and academia who've been collaborating for the past two years to connect the dairy and cosmetic industries to this new innovative value chain. First up is Flavia Pizzanou. She's the EU Projects Coordinator with Mambelli Limited. Flavia is going to share the story of involvement in the InGreen project, which began with a significant business problem to solve. A new life for the way with InGreen. Mambelli is an Italian dairy founded in 1972 in Romania, in the town of Bertinoro, Italy. It's a story of three generations of cheesemakers, a story of a family dedicated to the art of cheesemaking with passion and, and competence. Federica and Raffaella Mambelli carry on this tradition of family started in the first years of 1950 with the ricotta of Romagna made directly at home by their grandmother Elsa obtained from whole milk um, rather than the whey. Thanks to this success production increased more and more and today Mambelli is famous for the Squacquerona of Romagna DOP mascarpone, yogurt and several, several other typical products of uh, Romania's cheesemaking tradition. Um, about uh, the products, one um, of the most uh, important product is uh, the Squacquerone of Romagna DOP. Uh, it's uh, a soft cheese that belongs to the daily tradition of Romagna and it's characterized by distinctive creaminess and spreadability. 
It's a pleasant, sourish, yet delicate taste. Uh, its soft shape is uh, adaptable to the container in which it's placed. Uh, it's made from pasteurized whole cow's milk that is collected from a selected stable placed in area of uh, Emilia Romagna. And then uh, we add um, rennet, salt, uh, and um, starters to kick off the cheese making process. Uh, when the curd is formed, uh, it's broken and unloaded in the molds to or in order to drain the whey. Uh, it's then overturned several times with the tilter and stored for 24 hours in a cold room. Uh, finally, uh, squacquerone is packed and ready uh, to reach the final consumer. Um, another important product is uh, the ricotta um, uh, of Romagna, that it's uh, our original product because uh, it's obtained from uh, cow milk and enriched with uh, salsoiodic thermal water. Uh, this is uh, um, a water with elevated concentration of mineral salts and uh, its uh, properties uh, are known since the ancient Romans. Uh, it's uh, this particular water to give uh, of uh, Mambelli's ricotta this special, rich and natural taste uh, and give it particular flower. Mm, it's white with uh, a soft texture and a sweet and delicate flavor. Uh, it's obtained by heating milk up to 19 degrees. The height temperature uh, permits the outcrop of ricotta that is collected manually with colanders and uh, put into the molds. Uh, and the immediate cooling of ricotta is a fundamental step to obtain a um, contaminants free product and for this reason it's stored in the blast chiller for uh, a few hours uh, in order to reach the optimal temperature. Uh, regarding the market, uh, Mambelli uh, is, um, um, is active in the local markets but it's famous in all Romania and in all, um, also now in all Italy and in some foreign locations like the United States or uh, Japan. Um, tradition uh, has a, a central role in the mission of, um, of Mambelli Dairy. Uh, however, we, uh, we, are, we are also interested in innovation and sustainability. In fact, we produce organic, lactose-free and vegetarian product. Uh, we are also involved in a European project called In Green. It's a project funded by the European Union, Union aimed to uh, developing um, innovative and functional ingredients for feeds, foods, uh, nutraceutical and pharmaceutical products, cosmetic and biodegradable packaging. These ingredients are uh, obtained through biotechnological uh, processes, starting from byproducts of the paper and the food industry. Um, in particular, we reuse uh, the way um, that is the Meyer byproduct uh, obtained from our uh, cheese making. We produce bi biomass of Yarrovia lipolitica using squacquerone whey as a substrate of grow, following at uh, 72 um, hour uh, fermentation process with the help of a bioreactor. Uh, the most important parameters uh, like uh, condition of vegetation, aeration or concentration of salt were set uh, through several experimental trials uh, to obtain an optimal growth of the yeast. Uh, at the end uh, of the process, uh, the way obtained is used um, uh, as an adjuvant in the production production of cacciotte and in the treatment of, of them by dipping. Uh, 
the main objective are a shorter ripening time of the cheese thanks to the lipolytic and proteolytic characteristic of the yeast. Uh, furthermore, the protection of the yeast uh, on the surface of the cacciotta will prevent the use of uh, antifungal and antimicrobial uh, preservative called natamycin, which makes the rind uh, inedible. Moreover, we contribute to the chemical physical characterization of whey, which we often send to other ingredient partners to obtain LBA and GOS and rich way for use in nutraceutical and pharmaceutical product. Um, this experience sees us involved in continuous experimentation supported by the University of Bologna, in particular with the um, food science and technology department based in Cesena, which uh, supplies us with the trained of Yarovia Politica and provides an important contribution in the technical scientific field uh, to improve more and more the results obtained and achieve the objective set by the grant agreement. Uh, in particular, Mambelli uh, is proceeding with the production phase uh, of functional prototypes of Cacciotta and is moving toward the scale-up phase uh, with a view to expanding production. Uh, for ESME, SME uh, that think uh, of engaging in European research projects, uh, we recommend this precious opportunity to expand their knowledge and skills uh, in the technical scientific fields by interfacing with the realities other than the corporate one. Uh, furthermore, this, uh, this experience gives uh, to the companies the opportunity to develop extractive and interest interesting products for the market. Up next, we have Isis Pinnock. She's a scientific researcher with the startup company Activitech Limited, and they are located at Bias City in Nottingham in the UK. Isis will share the role of Activitech within the Inbring project and the exciting global market opportunities that the Inbring project aims to unlock. My name is Isis Pinner, a research scientist here at Activitech, and I want to welcome you to this presentation about the work that we're doing using Way within InGreen. First, I want to tell you a bit about Activitech. Activitech develop, design and scale up sustainable technologies to manufacture bio-based ingredients and materials from renewable feedstock. Activitech is a young startup from 2018, has been funded with 1 million euros in its early stages. And we are collaborating with more than 30 European partners, which include universities, feedstock suppliers, technology adopters and customers. We're based in BioCity in Nottingham in the UK and Activitech is a member of the UK Bioindustry Clusters. This includes the UK Bioindustry Association and BioVail. Let me tell you about some of the things that we do here at Activitech. We have state-of-the-art research facilities, which we use for technology development, scale-up of chemical processes, process engineering, outsourced research, collaborative R&D and technical and economic analysis. Some of the products that we work on include biotech and plant-based ingredients, bio-based platform chemicals and bio-based materials. Our young team is formed of our managing director, Jose Luis Malte, Dr. Nicholas Moody, our research scientist, Sana Salim, our research assistant, Matteo Everett, our marketing assistant, myself, another research scientist, and we are supported by Dr. Michelle Gradley, an experienced biotechnologist. Activitech's role of an in green includes process development for purifying lactobionic acid from enriched whey, which is produced using bacteria at the University of Bologna. We use scalable, safe, environmentally sustainable and economical technologies. So far, promising bench scale results, purifying lactobionic acid enriched whey to lactobionic crystals has shown up to 98% lactobionic acid purity. This LBA is now being used as an ingredient for dermatological products. We are fortunate enough to collaborate with Saputo Dairy UK, formerly Dairy Crest. We are funded by Resource Action Fund for this collaborative project with the aims of the direct valorization of whey through the conversion of lactose into prebiotics. 
Activitex developed technologies include ultrafiltration system with 10 to 50 kilodalton pore size for whey deprotonization and recovery of proteins, nanofiltration system with 150 to 800 daltons for sugar separation and small amounts of demineralization, electrodialysis for medium demineralization, iron exchange and size exclusion chromatography for the purification and fractionation of oligosaccharides and removal of small amounts of minerals left in solution. We use sustainable solvents for different operations and we also crystallise for final products. Our equipment is 1 to 5 litres in volume on site and we have collaborations with different open access pilot plants where we carry out larger trials for process validation. Activitech has also developed models for the process simulation and economic analysis of wave valorisation to produce LBA and GOS at commercial scale. So, why use cheese whey instead of lactose powder? It mostly comes down to pollution and potential profit. It is estimated that the whey produced annually by the EU dairy industry is about 75 million tonnes. Cheese whey constitutes one of the most polluting byproducts of the food industry due to its high organic load. Approximately 9 litres of whey is generated for every kilogram of cheese produced, and the average cost to dispose of whey for a small scale cheese producer can range between 3,000 to 5 to 7,000 euros per year. Approximately only 50% of worldwide cheese whey is treated and transformed into various foods or feed products. Transforming whey into both protein products or using fermentative processes, converting it to other value added products can reduce this pollution and also valorize the whey. One of the most conventional ways to valorize whey is by processing the proteins. This is done by drying the whey to make whey protein or by processing it to form whey protein concentrates and permeate. The permeate can then either be sold or processed further to form lactose, which can also be sold. The global market for whey proteins is 5.8 billion euros in 2019 and forecast to rise to 6.7 billion euros in 2024. Whey protein concentrates are used in many products from confectionery to muscle gain formulations. Whey protein concentrates with protein contents ranging from 35 to 90% can be produced by means of ultrafiltration or diafiltration. Prices then range from 3 to 12 euros per kilo depending on this purity. Furthermore, you can use iron exchange chromatography and more membrane technologies to remove more non-protonaceous material to create whey protein isolate, which contains more than 90% protein content. After removal of the proteins, you are left with a lactose-rich whey permeate. This would still be a strong organic pollutant, and so removal of the lactose by purification or fermentation will remove this pollutant potential and also valorize the whey by giving options to sell the lactose. The global market value for pharmaceutical and conventional lactose and permeate powder is valued at more than 2.2 billion euros in 2019 and expects to reach 2.41 billion by 2024. Whey permeate can be used in fermentation broths to convert lactose to organic acids, aroma compounds, bacteriosins, probiotics, biopolymers, bioalcohols and biogas. However, selling whey permeate or converting the lactose within whey permeate might not be that economically attractive, as it is currently being used for energy valorization. In some cases, such as this Wensleydale Creamery, the whey and whey permeate is used to feed anaerobic digesters without recovering any more material. However, we want to move up this pyramid from waste to prevention. How can we move up here and use this permeate for high value products rather than sending it for anaerobic digestion? One of the ways to create high value products from permeate is to create prebiotic dietary fibre such as galacto oligosaccharide, GOS. The global market size for GOS is estimated at 490 million euros in 2021 and estimated to rise to 850 million euros by 2026. This is used in infant formulas and meal replacers and pharmaceuticals and many more. It's priced around 1 to 10 euros per kilogram depending on the purity. It requires lactose powder or demineralized whey powder. GOS is produced using lactose through transgalactosylation, mostly using enzymes such as beta-galactosidase. A key player in this is the Nestle company who's using partially demineralized sweet whey powder and beta-glucosidase. Another way to create high value products from whey permeate is by producing cosmetic ingredients 
Enzymes, which are produced in certain bacteria, can convert lactose in whey permeate to lactobionic acid. The current lactobionic acid market is estimated to be worth about 20 million euros and is estimated to be worth about 31 million euros by 2026. The price of lactobionic acid is around 90 euros per kilogram and about 10 euros per kilogram for the lactobionate salts. Lactobionic acid is generally used in the cosmetic products as it is a polyhydroxy acid and this has moisturising, antioxidant and exfoliating properties. Other uses include preservatives in food and also within medicine for organ preservation. Current LBA production does not utilise bacterial fermentation broths and instead uses bromide salts during electrochemical oxidation of lactose powder. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. If you would like more information, please contact us. Next up, we have two fantastic speakers, Associate Professors Nuro Raidi and Beatrice Vitali, both of whom are from the University of Bologna. Both will share the significant work that has been carried out on both the production and the characterization of LBA and GOS. These are the two fantastic bio-based ingredients that are under development for the cosmetic sector. Good morning to everybody. First of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present our activities performed uh, in the frame of the Ingreen project and which um, focus on the production of lactobionic acid from cheese whey. LBA is indeed a, a, a biodegradable and biotic compatible compound that is also uh, characterized by uh, its high stability and uh, solubility in water. It is also uh, non-toxic and it has uh, an um, antimicrobial activity. These characteristics make LBA uh, suitable for the application uh, in different industrial sectors, ranging from food to cosmetics uh, uh, chemical industry as well as uh, uh, pharmaceutical and uh, biomedicine sectors. Uh, lactobionic acid is obtained from uh, uh, the oxidation of uh, lactose. This process could be performed through chemical route. However, um, uh, this process has uh, uh, limitation related to uh, the use of uh, costly and harmful catalysts uh, as well as uh, to the generation of indesirable side reaction products. Enzymatic and microbial production could be a valid alternative for a sustainable production of lactobionic acid. However, also in this case, uh, there are some bottlenecks related mainly to the use of redox mediators uh, as well as to cofactors that needed to be uh, regenerated. This uh, in addition to the cost of uh, uh, refining the lactose. The main task of uh, the DCAM was to develop and optimize the biotechnological process for the production of lactobionic acid from uh, cheese whey. This process would indeed valorize uh, byproduct highly produced by different uh, cheese making industries uh, and that is uh, most often used for cattle feeding into um, a high value fine chemical. Our activity uh, involved the first step of screening in which we use a different cheese whey, as sub pro cheese whey samples as substrate and uh, four bacterial strains. The experimental procedure included um, growth of bacteria in a rich medium and their transfer to the whey as substrate and the process was monitored uh, for microbial growth, for uh, LBA production and uh, um, uh, residual lactose by HPLC analysis, as well as through the measurement of the pH. Uh, from this first screening, we um, uh, were able to select uh, uh, two Pseudomonas strains. Uh, indeed, uh, for strain one, it was possible to reach productivity of up to 
17 gram per liter starting from different uh, batches of um, uh, cheese whey deriving from different uh, cheese making processes. Uh, in the case of strain 2, uh, uh, higher production was also achieved and indeed it was possible to uh, obtain up to 28 gram per liter. Based on these results, we uh, selected the strain Pseudomonas sp2 for uh, uh, the production of lactobionic acid in a steroid tank bioreactor. For this purpose, the strain was grown in a rich mead for 24 hours before being used for inoculating the uh, uh, fermenter. Uh, the process was monitored through uh, the um, uh, evaluation of bacterial growth as well as uh, through the quantification of the produced lactobionic acid and uh, the residual lactose. Using different whey batches de deriving from different cheese making industries, it was possible uh, to uh, achieve a significant improvement in uh, LBA fermentation yield, reaching up to uh, 37.5 gram per liter. Concluding from this activity, using different uh, cheese whey samples and different strains, it was possible to select at least one strain that is a high LBA producer. The strain was used for uh, uh, the production of LBA in um, 3 liters bioreactor and uh, was able to achieve uh, high LBA fermentation yields, uh, confirming that uh, the cheese whey is a suitable substrate for uh, the production of this fine chemical and this process is uh, um, uh, suitable for uh, uh, the um, uh, management of this byproduct. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for inviting me to this present event. My presentation will be focused on the characterization of the functional properties of the bio-based ingredients, LBA and GOS, produced in the green project. The homeostasis of the vaginal ecosystem depends on complex interaction and synergies between the host and different microorganisms that colonize the vaginal mucosa. The vaginal microbiota of healthy women is uh, typically dominated by lactobacilli, which form a critical line of defense, preventing the overgrowth of uh, potential pathogens through different mechanisms, uh, such as the maintenance of an acidic environment, the production of antimicrobial compounds, and the competition with pathogens for nutrients and adhesion sites. Unfortunately, sometimes this ecological balance may be disrupted and turns into a pathological state. Among the vaginal dysbiosis, the aerobic vaginitis is an inflammatory state characterized by dramatic decrease in lactobacillus species and overgrowth of aerobic bacteria, such as Escherichia coli, Staphylococcus aureus, and Enterococcus species, while the vulvovaginal candidiasis is due to an overgrowth of different candida species, in particular candida albicans. This condition can compromise the quality of life of women and expose to different gynecological complications. So the high incidence of recurrent vaginal infections, together with the growing emergence of drug resistance, underlie the need for the development of alternative and possible clean approaches for the prevention of dysbiosis. In this regard, the Green Project focused on two bio-based ingredients, BBLBA and BBGOS, to be included into cosmetic products intended for vaginal use. The role of my department, the Department of Pharmacy and Biotechnology of the University of Bologna inside the Green Project is to evaluate the impact of these ingredients on the vaginal microbiota. In particular, BBLBA has been selected as potential antimicrobial ingredient and it has been tested against bacteria and fungi responsible for vaginal dysbiosis. 
LBA from three uh, different ways of uh, uh, three different uh, cheese, uh, cacciotta, squacarone, and ricotta, were taken into account. We test both the capability of LBA to impair the proliferation of pathogens growth in a planktonic form and the effects on biofilms. This last aspect is of particular interest since the um, ability of these pathogens to form biofilms on the mucosal surface is an, import an important virulence factor that can impair the efficacy of commercially available products. We also thought for the effect of LBA on two lactobacillus species, Lactobacillus crispatus and Lactobacillus gasseri, which normally uh, colonize the healthy vaginal mucosa, acting as a, a protective barrier against pathogens. Thus, it's important that the, the impact of LBA on Lactobacilli is as low as possible. A BB GOS obtained from way of squacquerone has been selected as a pre a prebiotic in order to exert positive effects on a um, healthy vaginal microflora. Thus, it's uh, um, been tested for its ability to, to stimulate the planktonic growth of lactobacilli and to um, favor the formation of lactobacillus biofilms, which in this case can be important to uh, form a strong barrier against pathogens. Moreover, the impact of BB-GOS on uh, vaginal pathogens has been also investigated in order to exclude uh, undesired stimulating effects. This slide describes the effects of LBA on planktonic growth and biofilms of different bacteria and candida albican strains responsible for uh, vaginal infection. We can see that LBA is active in reducing growth, biofilm formation, and in eradicating preformed biofilms of all pathogens. We then verify that this inhibitory effect did not also affect lactobacilli, which represent the health-promoting component of the vaginal microbiota. Our data show that the growth of lactobacilli and their biofilms are not affected at all by this biobase ingredient. Regarding the biobase GOS, we investigated its prebiotic activity. In other words, the ability to stimulate the growth of vaginal lactobacilli, both in planktonic culture and in, bio, in biofilm form. The results of our experiments uh, highlighted this stimulation ability, which is preserved even by diluting the GOS. On the contrary, the biobase GOS was not able to uh, stimulate the growth of pathogenic bacteria and fungi. Indeed, at the highest concentration, it had an inhibitory effect. In conclusion, our functional studies have shown that the bio-based LBA, LBA exerts a good antimicrobial activity against the vaginal pathogens and that the bio-based GOS exerts a good prebiotic activity toward the beneficial component of the vaginal microbiota and that both ingredients by Green Project are very suitable and promising in the perspective to formulate cosmetics for vaginal use. Thanks a lot for your kind attention. Now over to Professor Patrick Sheldigan. He is a lecturer in molecular nanotechnology at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Northwest Switzerland. Patrick will discuss the technical and biocatalytic procedures required to produce the gas and also detail the challenges of scaling. Hello everyone, I'm Patrick Chagaldian. I'm glad to have the opportunity pre to present our work on biocatalytic nanoparticles for the production of galacto-oligosaccharides. So this work was carried out in the frame of the EU-funded In Green project, and it was carried out at the School of Life Science at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Northwestern Switzerland. So as a quick introduction on galacto-oligosaccharides, or GOS, 
Ghosts are made of beta link galactose moieties, so they are fairly short molecules. They are they occur naturally in the milk of some mammals, particularly marsupials, and ghosts are commercially applied as prebiotic functional food ingredients. Indeed, indeed ghosts display the great advantage of not being hydrolyzed by human digestive enzymes, but being fermented by colonic bacteria to fatty acid and carbon dioxide and hydrogen as side products. And GOS, they stimulate the growth and metabolism of intestinal bacteria. How to produce GOS? GOS basically would be very difficult to produce chemically. They are produced biochemically by a beta-galactosidase enzyme that breaks lactose, a common sugar present in milk at high concentration, into two pieces, glucose and galactose, that they can be used in glycolysis. Beta-galactosidase is also a very uh, interesting enzyme because it was at the center of the discovery of operons and the regulation of transcription by François Jacob and Jacques Monod, for which the not won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1965. Interestingly, the same enzyme, so the same beta-galactosidase, can run an oligomerization reaction transforming lactose into galacto-oligosaccharides by a transglycosylation reaction. And it is known that some beta-gal, depending on their organism, would favor this oligomerization reaction. And it's also known that having high concentration of lactose into the reaction favors this reaction. So this process is overall ba based on the use of enzymes. So enzymes are natural catalysts or biocatalysts, and they have a number of advantages when compared to chemical catalysts. First, they catalyze chemical reaction at, under mild condition, uh, fairly low temperatures, typically 20 to 40 degrees, depending on the enzymes and the process. The reaction is very often done in water or buffer and not in organic solvent. Enzymes are typically selective for their substrate, so selective for the molecules they will transform, and they are also selective in the product they are forming, and this is not only regio, but also enantioselectivity. However, there are several bottlenecks for the industrial implementation of enzymes. Uh, well, enzymes are proteins. Uh, they are typically not very stable when stored and typically require uh, low temperature and um, addition of stabilizers. And they also have a limited stability under operational conditions. Enzymes are also water-soluble species, so it's difficult to retain them when we want to use them under flow conditions. So, in my group, we are working on the nanoengineering of enzymes and with the ambition to attach them onto solid supports that are easier to manipulate, easier to retain, but also where they will experience a drastic increase in stability. So very briefly, we start with silica material. So typically silica nanoparticles, but we can go for big, bigger particles when needed. So silica, you know, it's made of silicon and oxygen, the two most abundant elements on the Earth's crust. So silica is very inexpensive material, is also chemically and physically stable, and it's available in both food grade or even pharma grade uh, when needed. So we start with those silica nanoparticles, and the first step is to attach the enzyme at the surface of the particle. So this is a covalent attachment, so we create a stable bond between the support and the enzyme material. So 
it's a long time we're working on this uh, reaction and we have a number of different options to immobilize uh, the enzyme in an optimal fashion so that we are not wasting enzymes. And already at this stage, there is an enhancement of the stability of the enzyme. And it's also easier to process, easier to carry. One can retain it uh, with a simple filter. We can also recover them by centrifugation. So the next step, and this is really where uh, we have a, a clear innovation, is that we are producing a layer that is surrounding the particle and shielding the enzyme. So we can go for a partial shielding or a full shielding of the enzyme. So the enzyme is really buried into a soft and porous material. But this material, this organosilica layer, help to retain the three-dimensional structure of the enzyme and provides a clear stabilization effect. So what we can say here is that the activity of the enzyme, as long as the substrate is small enough to diffuse through this layer, is maintained. We can control the composition of the, of the shield and we could measure a markedly enhanced stability versus physical or chemical uh, stress conditions. So in the frame of the InGreen project, the first task we needed to carry out before making the biocatalytic treatment with our nano biocatalyst was to pre-concentrate uh, the whey material, so to pre-concentrate the lactose contained into uh, the whey we were receiving from partners. Indeed, it's known that transglycosylation reactions are favored versus hydrolysis when we have high substrate concentration. So our target, and this number is reported in the literature, was to make um, a treatment where we could concentrate the lactose up to 200 gram per liter. So we carried out nanofiltration experiments and indeed uh, we managed to reach concentration in the range of 200 gram per liter and without any loss of uh, lactose substrate. So the next step consisted in selecting the appropriate enzyme. So we have been screening different beta-galactosidase and it turned out that um, an aspergillus beta-gal was providing the best productivity where we could reach versus the K-lactase beta-galactosidase, which is one of the most commonly used um, beta-galactosidase, a concentration of productivity of 31 gram per liter of GOS, which represents um, productivity of 17.2% versus Kelactis that gives um, maximum 10%. So then we worked on the enzyme protection. So as I showed you before, immobilizing uh, the beta-gal enzyme growing an organosilica layer around this immobilized enzyme and basically here we have been working on optimizing the composition of this layer so we use different chemical compounds i would not detail them here but i'm happy to provide you with more details when needed so we have been working with different chemicals and measured the activity versus the thickness of this protective layer and to make a long story short we can say that both layer thickness and layer composition have a strong effect on the productivity of the nanobiocatalyst. So the next step after the biocatalytic conversion is to downstream process the product of this biocatalytic uh, reaction. So we went on a tangential flow filtration system where basically there is a separation of small molecules versus bigger molecules. So here is a schematic representation where the feed is crossing to the retentate and small molecules that are contained uh, in this mixture go through the membrane to the permeate. And so we developed a system where we could basically select uh, among different commercially available 
fil filtration system or membranes uh, the best for our application. And so we could demonstrate that indeed uh, the costs produced are very well retained by a few of the uh, selected systems, so they are not crossing the barrier, uh, the, the filtration membrane. However, mainly lactose is also retained quite well, and one would need to run different cycles of TFF to get uh, basically a product which would contain mainly uh, galacto oligosaccharide. So let me finish this presentation on the last slide showing the value chain of gas production, the way we conceived it in the in-green project. So we received the raw material from Mambelli uh, Dairy. So as a, as a waste stream from the cheese production, we are dealing at FHNW with the biocatalytic transformation, also with the downstream processing in collaboration with the UK-based uh, SME Activatec. We are also at FHNW dealing with the characterization in collaboration with the University of Bologna, so characterization for life cycle assessment, but also uh, toxicity. And fi finally, the GOS is going uh, to be tested, is tested by Depo Pharma for uh, the final uh, application. On this, I would like to close this talk and thank you very much for your kind attention. Our final speaker now completes the story of building a new value chain from lab to market. Piero Shabia of Deco Pharma Limited, an Italian pharmaceutical company located in the Treviso region, outlines the company's ongoing work in taking a newly developed bio-based ingredient and forming new and innovative consumer products during the in-ring project. Good morning to all. I am Piero Savilla, R&D assistant at Depo Pharma, a pharmaceutical company. Thank you to have invited me at the In Green by Economy Week session, uh, where I will talk about the Depo Pharma experience in the bio-based innovation. Depo Pharma is an Italian pharmaceutical company that research and develop products uh, ensuring their high efficacy and safety by offering useful services to optimize the quality of life of patients. The Pharma success is due to the activities of four generations focused on healthcare. Starting from the late 19th century, Taddeo Dalla Zorza owned a pharmacy in Treviso and his wife Ida Zoya a pharmaceutical laboratory in Milan, passing through in 1929, when Antonio Dalla Zorza, a doctor and pharmacist, created in his pharmaceutical laboratory the AT ointment, a treatment for cough and pain. Then in 1970, Giovanni Dalla Zorza founded Depo Pharma, a company for the distribution of pharmaceutical products in Italy. Uh, since 2005, with Paola and Alessandra Dalla Zorza, Giovanni's daughters, Depo Pharma became a joint stock company focused on innovative projects. Uh, our way to work starts from a deep uh, activity of research and development of pharmaceutical formulations, that is uh, food supplement, cosmetics, and medical devices, and overall active ingredients for the treatment of pathologies in different therapeutic fields. Uh, the efficacy and safety of the Pharma products are based by clinical study and also um, in vitro and in vivo pharmacological trials, uh, thanks to the cooperation with specialist doctors, universities, and research centers. The scientific evidences of our results are reported in a paper uh, published in specific journals of sector. What do we achieve? Um, research activity completes uh, with the national and international patenting of active principles developed 
and our final targets are the specialistic doctors. Thanks to a wide network of medical scientific informants present in all Italian territory. We work in uh, um, several therapeutic areas, gynecology, proctology, gastroenterology, dermatology, and obstetrics. Actually, our energies are focused on the innovation uh, and on the sustainable, sustainable growth. The innovation uh, we are aiming on is to produce and patent new bio-based ingredients and products. And as a way of proceeding, uh, we approach to bio-based method starting studying uh, bacterial lysates. In fact, uh, we patented and now produced in our laboratory a purified parietal fractions of propioni bacterium acnes. Uh, through uh, fermentation and isolation of fractions of interest. Uh, the bacterial lysate is uh, patented in Italy, Europe, USA, um, Saudi Arabia, and Japan. But why we are so interested in bio-based ingredients? Because uh, production of such ingredients uh, uh, is safe. Uh, fermentation process results less energy expensive than uh, chemical process, but first of all, from a functional point of view, bio ingredients can also have additional benefits thanks to their more complex composition. Um, for example, bacterial lysate uh, resulted in a broad spectrum of activities. Uh, in fact, it has a, um, a function to clear the infections, bacterial, fungal, and viral infection by stimulating the immune system. It shows anti-inflammatory activities, reducing pre-inflammatory cytokines and mastocytes, and also um, uh, showed a wound healing action by stimulating uh, uh, tissue repair factor. Uh, thanks to this variety of function, bacterial lysate uh, is contained in our products that cover different therapeutic areas, gynecology, proctology, and dermatology. Thanks uh, to InGreen, uh, we have given uh, uh, the opportunity to deepen uh, the concept of bio-based production uh, in cosmetic. In fact, uh, we are testing two uh, bio-based ingredients. Uh, derived from way of cheese making, bio-based GOS and bio-based LBA. As uh, Professor Vitali uh, showed uh, previously, uh, they has um, efficacy against uh, urogenital infections, has prebiotic activity toward the vaginal microbiota, and MTU uh, showed also an efficacy on skin health. Uh, with greater efficacy compared to purified ingredients already present in the market. Uh, this broad uh, functionality led us to test these ingredients in different bio-based prototypes. Uh, bio-based GOST and bio-based LBA uh, is, uh, are used in cosmetic with the formulation of bio-based intimate cleanser, but also bio-based GOST um, is used to formulate a nutraceutical supplement and a vaginal gel. Uh, the functional characterization of selected prototypes is still in progress. Uh, despite uh, there are lots of advantages uh, to use bio-based ingredients in pharmaceutical fields, uh, as I previously described, and the greatest challenges uh, in operating in uh, this bio-based uh, contest uh, throughout all the uh, production chain is uh, to obtain safe bio-based ingredients and to obtain bio-based prototypes stable over time. Uh, instead, uh, in the field of social acceptance, uh, there is a few familiarity with the bio-based uh, concept among consumers. Uh, they need to be informed through scientific dissemination, seminars, workshops led by academics and industries, and also events uh, like this, uh, in which I had the pleasure of speaking. Thank you. Thank you to the presenters, and thank you for sharing such great information and insights from the InGreen project. 
I am delighted now to be able to host a really interesting and lively panel with the project participants on how to build and scale bio-based products. And we're looking to learn from you as well, the audience. What questions do you have that you'd like to ask these, the project participants and to figure out what can you do to help build new bio-based products? Joining us on our panel today is Flavia Pisanu. She's the European Projects Coordinator for the company Manzali, who you've heard from earlier. As well as that, you'll be joined by Emily Marsh, the EU Project Manager for Circular Bioeconomy at Munster Technological University. We'll also be joined by Beatrice Vitali. She's the Associate Professor in Microbiology at the Department of Pharmacy and Biotechnology at the University of Bologna. And we'll also be joined by Piero Chivari from the company Dio Pharma. As well as myself, I'm the MC today. My name is Katrina Power and I am the manager of the Circular Bioeconomy Cluster Southwest based at Munster Technological University. And we work with businesses on creating these new bio products for the market. And today in our panel session, we're going to talk about what makes a competitive, competitive bio product. You know, what are consumers' attitudes to buying these new types of bio products? And what is the talent and also, what are the key learnings that we need to be able to share and socialize, as well as to scale these new types of products in the market today? Brilliant. And here we are and at the virtual table. And I'm so pleased to be able to um, present this session today. And so I want to say to the audience, thank you for joining and thank you for listening throughout the entire session. You learned about the creation of a new value chain uh, with industry and with academia. And it's a great story of collaboration. And so what we're going to do is we're going to investigate a couple of questions today. But I want to say to the audience as well, there's a Q&A box. And so if you have any questions you'd like to ask the panelists, please do. This is your opportunity um, and to learn from these experts. OK, so why don't we dive straight in? And I'd like to kick off the panel session today by asking you know, our panelists, from their point of view, what do they see as the competitive advantages of bio-based products? And so we're going to start with um, from Piero's point of view from Dave Pharma. So Piero, would you would you kindly share your point of view? Yes. Uh, good morning at all. Uh, I would ask you if you hear me perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so um, bio-based um, ingredients are uh, uh, very different from. Uh, uh, classical ingredients uh, already present uh, in the market and that we uh, already uh, um, use or are using uh, in our products. Um, the use of uh, bio-based ingredients are giving us uh, um, several advantages uh, overall from a functional point of view since uh, um, they derive from a process of fermentation that uh, um, uh, give uh, as a result uh, the production of uh, 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 lots of compounds, proteins, uh, uh, secondary metabolites from bacteria that uh, all together in, the, in a bio-based ingredients lead to um, a broad um, spectrum uh, activities. In fact, uh, um, uh, they can uh, affect, for example, um, uh, positively and negatively um, the health of uh, uh, no, positively uh, in the health of uh, the final users from a microbiological point of view, but also on a dermatological point of view. Uh, in this specific case, I'm talking about uh, the intimate cleanser, and uh, also. Um, uh, compared uh, the corresponding uh, ingredients already present in the market, uh, we, uh, have, we can manage uh, in our laboratory, uh, in the final formulation, 
uh, um, easily. Uh, so uh, uh, there is uh, um, only advantages to use it without difficulties uh, in the formulation. Uh, we are also testing the stability by the time uh, over time uh, during storage of these uh, products and uh, they confirm also the stability of uh, these ingredients from a technological point of view. That's really important. Thank you, Piero. Um, I'll ask Beatrice now as well. So Beatrice, from your point of view, you know, what do you see as the competitive advantages of using a bio-based ingredient? Okay, thanks. Yes, as uh, um, I really described by Piero, the advantages of uh, bio-based ingredients uh, are uh, numerous. Uh, from a technical point of view, the fermentation process uh, to produce LBA and uh, the uh, bioconversion process to produce GOS have been set up with green approaches. We have uh, uh, exploited uh, different types uh, of way, uh, waste materials from the dairy industry and uh, we used um, strains and enzymes that are safe for humans and environments, uh, following a principle of uh, bioeconomy and circular economy. The really interesting aspect of this uh, biotechnolog biotechnological production is um, that the bio-based ingredients obtained are endowed with the more um, evident functional activities uh, than the uh, commercial ingredients, uh, um, each uh, are our reference controls. Uh, Bio-based ingredients uh, have uh, shown uh, more uh, than um, one biological activity, so um, they uh, can be defined as uh, multifunctional ingredients. In addition to be multifunctional, uh, these products uh, are uh, biocompatible. Uh, that means that uh, they are well uh, tolerated by um, human tissues and by the human microbiota. In other words, uh, um, they have no side effects. Um, in addition, uh, following the principle of uh, circular economy, uh, the production of these uh, bio-based ingredients uh, respect uh, the environment uh, and the planet. Thus, these ingredients are also uh, eco-sustainable. All these uh, characteristics, uh, uh, multifunctionality, biocompatibility, and eco-sustainability uh, make them successful from um, both the scientific and the industrial point of view. Great. Thank you, Beatrice. That's really helpful. And Thank you. A lot of, a lot of um, points there made about the, the advantages are so clear. Um, Flavia, from your point of view at Mambelli, like, you know, what, where is the competitive advantage for you? Good morning um, to everybody. Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm agree. Uh, first of all, I'm agree for with um, Piero and um, Beatrice and from um, my point of view, uh, using um, bio-based ingredients, uh, it's uh, an advantage because uh, first of all, take us uh, the opportunities uh, in our case, in the, in the case of Mambelli, to recycle um, the squacquerone way that uh, which is uh, the, the major byproduct of, obtained uh, for, um, from our cheese making. Uh, which uh, we use uh, as subset of grow um, of your Rovia Lipolitica and this aspect, um, it's a fundamental step to reduce uh, our impact of waste. Uh, another, another important aspect is that during um, our last uh, experimental trials, we are considering the ability uh, of uh, this uh, particular yeast uh, to protect the surface of the cheese from contaminants uh, in order to obtain uh, the, a final product without uh, the natamycin, which uh, is uh, an antifungal and antimicrobial um, preservative, which makes uh, the rind inedible. So 
for this reason, for us, it's a double advantage because uh, um, on the one hand, uh, it's uh, allow us to reduce our impact on waste. And on the other hand, uh, it's a way to obtain a natural final product that today uh, is in demand and much uh, uh, appreciated by the consumer in general. Great, thank you, Flavia. And you pick up on a really interesting point there. Um, so on the consumer side of things. And so there is a lot of work being done, a lot of body of work being done around consumers and their acceptance of bio-based ingredients. And perhaps Emily, you know, you're working on a project here like on this, perhaps you can kind of give an overview of what you see as consumer demand around bioproducts. Yes, thank you, Katrina, and thank you for inviting me on today. I agree with what everyone else is saying. Of course, the benefits of bio-based products are around uh, waste valorization and in environmental improvements, um, you know, uh, around the ingredients and packaging of those bio-based products. There's those uh, particular advantages directly for, for the environment. But then for brand owners and consumer, there are a number of advantages as well. So for brand owners, um, that increased uh, green uh, markability of their products um, and also uh, kind of uh, to comply with certain regulations, uh, you know, all the new EU laws and regulations coming in um, and uh, taxes on uh, fossil based products and ingredients. So there's that incentive and benefit there for brand owners, but then also from the consumer uh, perspectives there's a certain increased uh, functionality of certain bio-based ingredients and, and products, um, uh, but also then um, for um, their uh, end of life. So for um, consumers that uh, there's that increased, increasing awareness is important around the end of life of uh, bio-based products. And there's that uh, advantage there that uh, for the recyclability and cost compatibility of certain products. Great, great. Um, and Emily, in your in your um, body of work with the BioSwitch project, you know what what's I think there's some very interesting statistics, and so around awareness of bio based, and so in the countries you focused on, you know, is the awareness of um, bio based products quite high? Um, unfortunately, uh, not. There's, there's a bit of uh, mix there. So yes, we did a consumer study acceptance analysis of bio-based products um, in Ireland, um, uh, Holland, the Netherlands, and Finland. So we have a number of uh, results there uh, from consumers. Uh, so it was, interestingly, um, it was quite uh, positive um, in Ireland, uh, uh, slightly more so than the Netherlands, uh, which was. Uh, unusual, um, but 93% of uh, respondents, uh, consumers indicated that they would like to buy uh, bio-based products uh, compared to fossil-based. So this, this is quite a positive um, outlook that there, there is that interest there from consumers and there is that willingness uh, for consumers to, to take on board that and transition uh, along with the, the brand owners and the whole value chain. Consumers have that willingness as well uh, to take on board uh, bio-base. So around certain kind of um, brands, uh, then there, there wasn't as much kind of awareness of uh, current uh, branding um, and certain brands around, I think it was uh, about 70% were not familiar with any bio-based brands. Um, kind of some of the larger ones like um, Alpro, Ikea, they, they were given as uh, known bio-based brands. So there is that willingness there from consumers, but perhaps not quite the awareness yet. So it's, it's about that increasing that, that awareness for consumers is very important. Very good, okay. Um, I guess the next question then, you know, to lead on from that is, you know, and I'm, I'd love everyone's, you know, for everyone to maybe provide some input is here is, what do we need to do to increase that awareness from, from both the consumer and the brand level? And um, maybe Flavia, you might have a thought, some, Piero, you might have some thoughts, Beatrice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Fl Flavia, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah sorry. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, it's uh, important, it's very important to, to us to explain uh, um, to our consumer uh, the difference, with, which are the importance of uh, bio-based ingredients and the difference between organic and bio-based product. 
uh, because in fact, in effect, we can use organic to uh, indicate uh, organic or natural materials, while the term biobase refer to the type of raw materials used to manufacture a product uh, doesn't refer to the materials produced, and uh, which means uh, that if uh, it, uh, that if a product is biobase, it's a partially or entirely made up of biomass, uh, for example, uh, from uh, renewable materials of plant and uh, animal um, origin. And we think it's important to use not only conventional channels to inform consumers, but uh, um, for example, uh, um, uh, the, the direct relationship between people. For example, in, in our case, which uh, um, the people between Mambelli, but also um, speak about this project uh, uh, between family, with family, friends, and uh, um, acquaintances. Uh, it's uh, and uh, sorry, it's um, an important way to us to create uh, uh, awareness for consumers to address them towards uh, greener and more sustainability choices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Piero, I guess from your side, you know, from the from the from another company perspective, you know, how important is it for you to be able to communicate and you know the importance of biobased. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's important uh, to involve uh, as much as possible um, the final users uh, on the story of the product, um, because uh, if uh, uh, the final users um, uh, know well the history of the product and uh, how it is produced, and uh, the high value of uh, its sustainability, uh, people feel um, um, completely involved and uh, try to take part uh, also in their daily um, uh, our, uh, behaviors mm -hmm. um, uh, to a more sustainable uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a question here that's come in from Christina Shalom, um, and it's an interesting question. In what way is the biotech industry superior to the chemical industry? And I don't know about superiority, but I think there's some probably symbiotic relationship in learning. But maybe um, would any of our panelists like to take that question? Beatrice, maybe? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so Christina, from our, I guess from our point of view, it's, it's not necessarily about industries being superior, it's more about collaboration between industries. And that's kind of the point of view that we would hold here. Um, so, but if any of the participants have, any of the, the um, uh, participants on the call today have other questions they'd like to answer, please feel free to share. Um, so what I'd like to ask now is, you know, this is, In Green is a very big, project it's it's a very significant project it's and there's a lot of success with this project as well and you know bringing a new product to market takes a lot of effort and so there's a lot of learning to share um, around this and I know there is many there's many people around Europe and also in Ireland working in the agriculture and food industry and the dairy industry and other in the, all these types of primary industries who are trying to figure out well how do I create a value-add product like you know what do I need to do and so I guess um, it'd be really interesting to hear, um, you know, some learnings from your perspectives. So I guess uh, Beatrice, from your point of view, um, you know, what kind of, what learning would you share from someone from a, from a research in institution perspective, you know, who's interested in going about taking a Horizon 2020 project and, you know, starting that process? Thanks, yes. Uh, I, I, I think that the first suggestion for people who want to participate in BBI project is the motivation and passion for the issues of the circular and the clean economy. Having a cleaner, a more uh, sustainable planet is a great ambition and challenge. I think 
this proposal must be the first and the greatest motivation of a BBI project. After the motivation and interest in a, a BBI issues, I think it's also um, very important to study the background and the um, relevant scientific literature. Uh, it's uh, crucial, crucial to analyze the funded BBI projects that are described in the EU portal and to read and analyze the scientific articles describing the results achieved and the patents feed. This preliminary knowledge, I think, is a good basis for finding the right partners and writing a good project. Uh, in conclusion, I believe that the study of uh, data relating to uh, publishing scientific articles, uh, patents, and uh, European funded projects allow us, uh, allow people to uh, identify um, authors and partners um, with experience uh, in the sector of BBI and the circular economy. Uh, to be um, contacted in order to build a new and fruitful um, collaboration. So this is my advice for people who want to approach um, BBI projects. Yeah, that's very solid advice as well. And I guess, you know, now with the, the New Horizon and also the BBI GAU, is, well, it's changing to circular bioeconomy and CBE. So that's, you know, there's a lot of scope I guess, for new projects to come about in the near future. Um, I guess from a, from a, I guess, continuing on the research perspective there, on the, from the research institution perspective, Emily, you know, do you have any lessons or learning to share from taking part in these big projects that you'd like to share with the audience? Yes, I, I think so. I agree with Beatrice there, the, the importance of uh, building those uh, connections, you know, not just through academia, but all the stakeholders of industry, SMEs, like yourself, they could work with the bioeconomy clusters. That, that uh, type of work is important, that integration and that sharing of knowledge. So it's where the BBIJU um, uh, is most of a benefit, is about bringing those different stakeholders together. But then also for uh, kind of the uh, circular bioeconomy and uh, brand owners industry side, uh, creating those value chains. So bringing those type of uh, industry partners together and uh, connect connecting them. Because it's, it's difficult uh, for the brand owners, you know, there's the, the increased cost, um, you know, the new supply chains. It's providing that information support as well as uh, financial. Yeah. Absolutely. You touched on a good point there, Emily. It's about de-risking the innovation and then trying to get it to market, right? Um, and so I guess from a company perspective, like, you know, to take part in a project of this scale, you know, what kind of what kind of learning do you want to share? Um, Flavia, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're deeply embedded in the project as the coordinator. So what do you, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I'm a completely degree with um, Beatrice. Uh, because uh, to participate participating uh, um, uh, to a project uh, of um, of this scale is important it's very important the motivation and the passion uh, with the, with the research in general uh, for me it's uh, it's uh, my first experience uh, to participate uh, of um, of a project european project and uh, for now it's a very formative experience for, for me, for us, to participate at this project, uh, which takes um, as the opportunities uh, to interface with uh, other companies, but also with the technical and uh, scientific researchers in general. And uh, for this reason, um, also because in Green Project in particular, always offer to us uh, uh, new inputs to improve more and more our results. Um, we uh, we I, we advise strongly to um, the participating to um, European BBI project to discover new realities uh, to establish uh, trust and friendship relations with the other partners, uh, but also to let to let know the our company reality uh, and um, our commitment about innovation and sustainability in this case, and uh, for more. 
more, uh, we think it's a precious opportunity to enrich uh, our knowledge and our cultural uh, baggage. Great. Thanks very much for your perspective, Flavia. And uh, Piero, you. from your point, of, from, your, from your company's perspective, you know, what, what learning would you like to share? Uh, right. All uh, of the previous partners already said, but I just want to add uh, that uh, to participate in uh, a European project like uh, in green, uh, for my, in my opinion, uh, a company uh, need to have a clear uh, long-term vision of uh, the needs of the company because uh, uh, this project, uh, this project like in green uh, last long time. This is a uh, three years and half project. So um, uh, it um, needed to have a clear vision because uh, it's big and uh, also it is uh, so uh, challenging uh, uh, experience. So um, uh, they require energy, uh, they require also capacity to uh, a cooperational um, effort. Uh, and also a dialogue, dialogue with other partners and uh, have flexibility. And another thing, it's also important overall in this project uh, in which we are uh, studying a research for new uh, functional ingredients to have uh, clear uh, the regulatory aspect that is uh, very important. Uh, because uh, if it is clear, the regulatory aspect is uh, uh, clear also the final application uh, without uh, any difficulties. Great, great. Thank you very much, Piero. Um, and so what, we're, we're going to conclude the panel now, but um, I want to say thanks to everyone for participating. And, you know, today we had the, you know, we heard from everybody the advantages of what bio-based ingredients can do for the cosmetics industry, but also the advantages for each of the, the organizations in that value chain. Because all the advantages and the benefits come back to everybody. And that's, you know, how to build a really successful one. And I guess, secondly, as well, you know, we are, we're hearing a lot around consumer attitudes and the need for education to enable uptake of these types of products. And thirdly, you know, it's about having that roadmap. So if you're interested in these types of projects and getting involved and pulling them together, you know, for the next suite of Horizon funding, having that roadmap and knowing where you want to go and enable success. Um, and I think that's, you know, how you help to identify partners as well and all those different types of stakeholders. So I want to say thank you to everybody for joining today and thank you to our panelists as well for making the time. And yeah, it's, a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, great opportunity. Thank you.